Honorable Senators, I call this meeting of the Standing Senate Committee on Transport and Communications to order. This morning, the committee is continuing a study on the development of a strategy to facilitate the transport of crude oil to eastern Canadian refineries and to ports on the east and west coast of Canada. Our meeting today will have two parts. For the first hour, we will hear from a researcher from the University of Ottawa. During the second hour, we will hear from the Assembly of First Nations. Our first witness is Professor Monica Gattinger of the School of Political Studies at the University of Ottawa. She is also the director of the Institute for Science, Society, and Policy. Her area of expertise includes energy policy and governance. In the past few days, we've had a few changes in our schedule, and I would like to thank Professor Gattinger for her flexibility. I will now invite her to begin her presentation. Afterwards, honorable senators will have questions. Professor? Thank you. As was mentioned, I'm the director of the Institute for Science, Society and Policy at the University of Ottawa. I also chair uh, an initiative called Positive Energy at the University, which I'll speak to in a moment. Um, as director of the Institute, one of our areas of expertise and interest is evidence-based decision-making. And I'd like to congratulate the Senate Committee for undertaking this very important study and um, looking to the evidence around uh, these key issues regarding Canada's, energies, Canada's energy future. It's an honour to be here today. I thank you very much for the invitation. My presentation will be made in English. Mais si jamais il y a des questions en français, il me ferait un plaisir de vous répondre. But if you have any questions in French, I would be pleased to answer you in the language of your choice public confidence in energy development in Canada with the somewhat unusual subtitle of elephants, horses and sitting ducks. I'll speak to that metaphor in a moment, but it's a metaphor that we have found in our research is really quite useful for thinking through some of the issues that pertain to public confidence in energy development. The context for this presentation is the Positive Energy Project, which I'll speak to uh, in a moment. And then I'll dive straight, in, straight into discussing public confidence, looking at some of the drivers underpinning public confidence, and beginning to think through a diagnostic. Why are we seeing some of the challenges that we're seeing in terms of social opposition to energy development? And this is where we get into the metaphor of elephants, horses, and sitting ducks. And I'll end off with a some ideas around a prescription for how to strengthen public confidence. So Positive Energy is an initiative at the University of Ottawa that uses the convening power of the university to bring together key energy players to strengthen public confidence. And those players are policymakers, regulators, industry, environmental NGOs, indigenous groups, and academia. But we do more than just convene. We do what I refer to as convening plus, which means we also take solution-oriented applied research to inform dialogue and action. So today's presentation um, is drawing on a paper, a framing paper, uh, that I'm currently writing on public confidence, uh, which will be released in the coming weeks. And in essence, what this paper aims to do is to connect the dots when it comes to the challenge of garnering public confidence in energy development. It draws on our research to date, draws on other research that's being undertaken by a variety of other organizations uh, in this sphere. And a summary of this paper, a summary version of it, was um, used as a discussion paper at a stakeholder workshop last week in Winnipeg that in the lead up to the Energy and Mines Minister's Conference this year in, uh, in Winnipeg. The overarching message, and my overarching message today, is that public confidence and the development of public confidence in energy development is a multifaceted challenge. There are many strands to this issue, many moving parts, and there's a really important and extensive need for collaboration and coordination across governments, policy, and regulation. So what drives public confidence? I'm on slide uh, five now here. We can think of three key drivers that influence and impact uh, public confidence. Certainly governments, uh, policy approaches, regulatory approaches, but also industry, uh, notably industry performance uh, in the energy sector, as well as society, 
Right? So people look to what are NGOs saying uh, about, en about energy development, what are local communities, whether those are local communities, indigenous communities, what are their um, uh, uh, responses to energy development. And people also, of course, listen to their friends and think through um, th their um, discussions with friends and neighbours as well when it comes to their level of public confidence in energy <coughs> development. <laughs> but if we turn to slide six, this is really where we get into the diagnosis. Why are we seeing such high levels of social opposition to energy development in recent times? And I think it's important to underscore that it is, this is not exclusively a challenge for fossil fuels. While pipelines and oil and gas development are often the flashpoints for social opposition to energy, we can think about renewable projects as well, whether that's large-scale hydro, uh, wind farms, is also in many instances is recently um, facing social opposition. So what I'm going to get into in this presentation now is looking at a number of <coughs> interlocking factors uh, that are helping us to try to understand why are we seeing um, social opposition and reduced levels of public confidence in energy development. The first of which, if we look at the outer circle, is social and value change. And this is social and value change across all, uh, all sectors, but certainly having an impact on energy development. Then when we get into the energy space, we can look at a number of policy gaps, and I'll talk about those uh, in a moment. Public authorities also have responses to these policy gaps, so whether that's policy makers or energy regulators. And then there are also, of course, project proponent practices. In this presentation, I'm just going to focus on the first three of those circles, social and value change, policy gaps, and public authorities' uh, <coughs> responses. So this is where we get into the animal uh, metaphor. So I'm on slide seven now. Social and value change. We begin to th come to think of the, these issues as horses that have left the barn. There have been fundamental changes in society and in social values in the post-war period. And I'm going to point to five of them here that are having a significant impact upon public confidence in energy development. Across Western industrialized democracies, we see a decline of trust in institutions, <coughs> whether that's governments uh, or industry, and a decline of deference to authority and to expertise. One of the consequences of this is that we're also seeing a reduced trust in the evidence, um, whether that evidence is being prepared by governments, uh, by expert um, uh, scientific bodies and the like, a reduced level of trust in evidence. That's a challenge for energy development. Second, a desire for greater public involvement in decision making. Citizens want to be involved in decisions that affect them. But what the, one of the consequences of this is that we're increasingly seeing tensions between participatory democracy and representative democracy. So participatory democracy, folks wanting to be involved in decisions that affect them, and representative democracy, elected officials at the end of the day needing to make decisions. Third, we're seeing a shift from communitarian to individual values. Right? So the line of sight for folks' interest is increasingly at the individual level rather than at the community, regional, or national level. And one of the consequences of this is that appeals to the national interest are gaining less traction. Fourth, a rise of what, what can be thought of as anti-corporate values, uh, so less, less confidence in big business uh, and a preference often for smaller scale locally owned projects over larger scale um, uh, big, big business quote unquote uh, projects. And then finally a decline in risk tolerance. Right? So lower levels of trust that whether it's governments or industry can properly identify risks of, uh, related to en energy development and can actually mitigate uh, those risks. So bottom line, we aren't in 1950s <laughs> Kansas uh, anymore. The horse has left the barn on these issues. This social and value change is the, uh, very much a new reality when it comes to uh, energy decision making. So what about the elephants? What are the elephants in this metaphor? Well, the elephants are the policy gaps uh, that are, again, having an impact on public confidence in energy uh, development. In the paper, we're, we're using the metaphor of many elephants in many rooms, and I'm going to point to three of those here, the first of which is climate change. So in the absence of, from many folks' perspectives, meaningful movement and adequate forums 
for um, grappling with climate change, um, that we're beginning to see much more opposition to individual energy projects for broader policy reasons related to climate change than to the individual project per se. Second, reconciliation and Indigenous concerns when it comes to energy development. Um, as we know, many of these issues go far beyond energy. It's about clean drinking water, <coughs> appropriate housing, education, murdered and missing Indigenous women, and many of these issues are then sort of finding themselves washing up on the steps of individual energy project proposals. Finally, a lack of mechanisms to address the cumulative effects of successive energy projects or to plan regionally around, uh, around projects. Many of these elephants, these policy gaps, are exacerbated by siloization both within and between governments, hence the call uh, that I mentioned at the outset of the presentation for greater coordination between governments. So what is the impact of this? This is where the sitting ducks come in. So in this context of social and value change, of policy gaps, energy decision-making processes have been at some level sitting ducks uh, in that context. Many of these unresolved policy is issues, as you'll see on slide nine, are actually beginning to be played out in regulatory processes for individual energy project proposals, right? And some of the reactions that public authorities are having to this, whether it's trying to reduce the level of involvement uh, of people in regulatory processes or whether it's trying to reduce timelines around, uh, around regulatory processes are actually serving to further undermine uh, public confidence. So what to do in this context, and this is where the presentation uh, will leave off. Four key things that I'd like to point to. The first is to accept the horses. <laughs> Accept that social and value change, those fundamental changes, mean that we are in a very different context for energy development than we were in, let's say, the 1950s. I mean, if you look at the pipeline sector, the last time we had this many major pipeline proposals either on the books or before regulators was in the 1950s. Uh, and at that time, a Royal Commission was struck to try to sort through how to uh, address these various issues. But again, Fast forward to 2016, very different context in terms of social uh, and value change. We can't turn back the clock on it. We have to think through how do you do energy uh, in that context. Second, befriend the elephants. So we have a number of policy gaps that governments um, uh, um, would do well to address. Notably, as I mentioned earlier, around climate, around reconciliation and around cumulative and regional effects of energy development. And then third, get the sitting ducks back on their feet. How can we go about strengthening energy decision-making processes and strengthening confidence in energy decision-making? And that's not only in terms <coughs> of the substance <coughs> of decisions, so ensuring that decisions um, are, are made in ways that are seen to be fair, that are made based upon the best available evidence, but also focusing in on the process of energy decision making as well, ensuring that there is access um, uh, for individuals to be involved in energy decision making, that uh, information is available for those who are interested, that whether it's individuals or, or groups or communities have the capacity to be engaged in energy decision making, and also ensuring that those processes are seen to be representative. And the final thing I will end on um, is that I'm actually cautiously optimistic and I think there's a very exciting opportunity for Canada to move from the bleeding edge to the leading edge of this issue. Um, as a democracy, we are facing these challenges, as are many other Western industrialized democracies with large resource bases. I think Canada has a real opportunity here to think through how do you do energy decision making in the 21st century. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. We'll now turn to the Senator for questions. And we'll start with Senator Doyle. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, in our uh, committee hearings, uh, we've had uh, many references to social license as it applies to pipeline projects. And 
Depending on who you talk to, the, the concept can mean anything from genuine consultation to int uh, from interested and affected groups to uh, groups who could very well have a de, de facto veto power over the project. And somewhere in the middle of all that, you, you have the national interest. In your view, are these two concepts closely related? Uh, are they mutually exclusive uh, of each other? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. <coughs> um, the concept of social license, and there's been a good deal of debate within energy circles about the utility and value and appropriateness of that concept. I think it's important to recognize that that concept emerged in the mining sector as the social license to operate. And it applied exclusively, and it still does, apply exclusively to individual mining companies and their operations with respect to a particular project. As um, some of the challenges around energy began to become more and more salient, um, folks were looking for, you know, what's a concept that can help us to think through these issues? And that concept of social license came to be also applied to the energy sector. But m my view on the way that it's been applied in the energy sector is that it hasn't necessarily been helpful in advancing um, a productive conversation around these challenges. Because it's been applied in such a way, rather than focusing exclusively on individual companies' practices, it's actually been applied in a way that, that extends across the entire decision-making processes, including policymakers and regulators. So taken to its, its, its extreme, it's, it's precisely as you've mentioned, um, Senator, and I thank you for the question, one could look at this concept as actually conferring a veto point on, or a veto on any individual or group that opposes a particular energy project. I don't think that's a direction that we want to go in. I think what we need to think through in a democratic context, again, is how do you balance participatory democracy, people being involved with, at the end of the day, representative democracy, and governments, whether it's regulators or politicians, needing to make decisions. And I think strengthening confidence in that process of energy decision making, that's where we should be focusing our efforts. And our work, I'll just conclude on this, we have, ex we have very consciously not used that concept of social license for precisely that reason. We've either spoken to public confidence, as I have today, or social acceptance and support for energy. Mm. Uh, we've also heard that uh, certain pipeline projects, uh, they've achieved considerable buy-in by groups uh, in whose territory a given pipeline might be slated to go. In your view or experience, uh, what is the buy-in? Does it include a, a sharing of resource revenues and pipeline jobs and even consultation uh, with groups long after the pipeline has been finished? very much, again, comes to what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, social and value change, and individuals wanting to have a say in decisions that affect them, and increasingly um, that, that the line of sight for interests is at the local or the community level. So for these large linear infrastructure projects, um, I think it's very important to think through not only what our decision-making processes look like for those projects, ensuring that we've got good opportunities for individuals to be involved, ensuring we've got decision-making processes in which there is public confidence, mm -hmm. um, but also to think through, <coughs> and this, uh, we're doing sort of some early work around this, what does fairness look like in the 21st century. Um, and if you look to the United States, some of the jurisdictions that are developing um, shale gas, where hydraulic fracturing is being undertaken in fairly extensive ways, they've begun to think through how can you try to ensure that the distribution of benefits and costs around the development of that resource is done in such a way that it's perceived as fair, not only at, let's say, the state level, but also at the local level as well. And in some instances, that has actually meant um, a funneling 
of severance taxes, the roughly the equivalent to, to royalties here in the Canadian context, to local communities in a very direct way so that the, those communities can see the direct benefits to that development uh, to their community. These are, again, some of the balances that we need to be trying to strike in the current environment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Doyle. Senator Unger. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gretiger, for your presentation. Uh, I'm from Alberta, and we certainly know, <laughs> know a lot of these issues. Um, going back to your uh, slide about what drives public confidence, um, industry, you mentioned, has, has a role. And I wonder what your opinion is of how industry, and I'm talking the pipeline, uh, the hydrocarbon industry, how they have performed. I think it would be difficult to answer that question in, in, in a blanket way. I mean, industry, as you would well know, there are many different companies, each with different sort of cultures and, and, and histories uh, and practices. Um, one of the challenges, I think, that, that um, we're facing currently, and I didn't mention it in the presentation, but I think it's important to recognize, is that, you know, as a result of the quote-unquote shale revolution, we're really seeing a transformation in North American energy markets and the changes in the ways, the, the, the directions, the destinations, where are the producing areas, where are the consumption areas, that has meant significant transformations in energy infrastructure, including in pipelines. So as I mentioned you know, a, a, a moment ago, you would have to go back to the 1950s in the Canadian context to see this many major pipeline proposals either on the books or before um, regulators. So pipelines are getting attention in a way that they have not had attention on themselves for many, many years. And again, in a social context that has been fundamentally changed, right? So we've got, as I mentioned earlier, climate change, increasing concerns uh, about climate change and so many pipeline projects actually being targeted over concerns about climate rather than concerns about the individual project um, per se. Uh, we've got pipelines transiting through areas or proposed to transit through areas that perhaps have not had pipelines before and again in a context of um, increasing recognition and rights for indigenous peoples and concerns over reconciliation. Um, so I think industry is grappling <laughs> with how to function in this very different context. I mean, as we know, and, and I would imagine you have had witnesses before you who would say when it comes to the performance of the pipeline sector, 99.999, you know, add however many nines the pipeline sector is able to, to, to calculate it to, is able to deliver its produ product safely and without incident. What we do see, though, um, when there is an incident, of course, it receives a tremendous amount uh, a tremendous amount of attention. So I think industry is grappling with these issues and trying to think through how do we develop greater levels of confidence uh, in our industry in a context, again, where social and value change is such that people will more often remember the pipeline spill than they will the 99.999% uh, percent of product that makes its way to its destination without incident. Yeah. Um. Just to, to comment about uh, Alberta and the oil sands, uh, there are more than 1,700 people, Aboriginal people, uh, in permanent jobs at the oil sands. And over the past 14 years, uh, Aboriginal companies have earned over $8 billion, $8 billion in revenue through working relationships mm -hmm in the oil sands. And in 2011 and 2012, oil sands companies contributed more than $20 million to Aboriginal communities mm -hmm. in that area. So I think that Alberta has done extremely well mm -hmm. in working with uh, Aboriginal people. But I have another, a different question, and this one is about the uh, NEB. 
In a summary of the white paper that you co-authored, one recommendation is to make changes to the NEB Act mm -hmm. to ensure that the NEB is unconstrained in its abil ability to regulate appropriately and has public confidence in its mandate and decisions. And I would certainly agree with that. I wonder if you can elaborate on how the NEB is currently constrained and what specific changes you feel are necessary in order to free the NEB from that controversy. Mm. Thank you very much um, for the question and, and I also appreciate the information relayed about Indigenous communities and the um, benefits that many Indigenous communities are seeing uh, from hydrocarbon development. We often hear sort of the negative side and not necessarily the, the positive side, so thank you, uh, thank you for that. With respect um, to the white paper, as you mentioned, I was a co-author on a white paper on quote-unquote social license that was um, uh, spearheaded by the University of Calgary School of Public Policy. That paper was, I think it is important to, to note, um, was a, a, a work of multiple academics. It was a wonderful experience to be involved in, uh, but I think it's noted in the paper that it's not a work, uh, a, not a work of consensus. So as with many um, issues and, and including obviously this one, uh, there are tremendous levels of debate around what the appropriate diagnosis is, what prescriptions um, should be. So I wanted to just give that rather lengthy caveat to say that what I'm about to, to share with you is my own view and not necessarily reflective of, of others um, that were involved in preparation of that uh, of that white paper. Um, you know, again, to come back to the presentation that, that I've just made, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing such tremendous focus um, and controversy in the regulatory process has less to do with regulation and energy regulation per se and far more to do with the policy gaps, the elephants in the room that I mentioned uh, earlier in my presentation. So it's so important for us when we're thinking through what kind of changes might we make to regulatory systems, notably um, the NEB, to ensure that we're working with an accurate diagnosis of the problem and not focusing exclusively uh, on, one, uh, on one area. Um, so change to the regulatory system, uh, in my view, is, is, is necessary. Strengthening public confidence in that system is absolutely essential, but it's a necessary but insufficient condition when it comes to strengthening public confidence in energy uh, decision making for all the reasons I, uh, I, I mentioned uh, a moment ago. I think we need to, to really um, uh, look carefully at the relationship between policy makers and regulators and again reinforce that important role that the regulatory process plays in terms of an evidence-based uh, neutral objective, um, expert-based assessment of individual project proposals. That may very well mean thinking about how do we do a better job of ensuring information access and representation uh, in that process. But again, in the absence of dealing with some of these elephants in the room, um, the strengthening public confidence in energy development, you can only go so far with changes to the regulatory system. Thank you. thank you very much. Second your Thank you. Um, Senator Mercer. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. And uh, uh, I, I wanted to clarify a, a term you used because uh, people watching may not understand it. I'm not sure I do. Uh, you, under your, under your horse of social and value change, uh, you said shift from uh, communitarian to individual values. What's a communitarian? <laughs> um, group values, for uh, uh, an easier way of putting it. So shifting from um, thinking about society writ large and interest with respect to society writ large uh, and a, a greater focus over the last number of years, last number of decades, we've seen towards individual interests and line of sight when it comes to thinking through whether support for whether it's an individual energy project or energy policy frameworks, much greater focus at the individual and local level over the group, societal, could be regional, could be provincial, could be national level. Uh, yes, thank you, and, and, and I guess uh, 
one of the issues I see is, is, is the fact that we're not looking at this in a, from a national perspective. We're not talking about what well, we are in, in, in the case of my province of Nova Scotia. We're talking about getting, getting oil and gas from, uh, from Alberta yeah. to my, my province. But we're, our, we're, one of our main purposes here is about getting uh, oil from, from Alberta, Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. to Tidewater so we can export it to other people around the world at uh, prices higher than we are selling it to the Americans because the Americans, of course, take a discount. Right. And uh, this is the issue, and, and, I, and so I, I get to uh, I get to your uh, other uh, hitting of, of what to do, and you said getting the ducks back on their feet, strengthen uh, confidence in energy decision making, uh, substance fairness, evidence based, uh, etc. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, tough, tough question. Uh, thank you for it. Um, if, if, and we've, we've undertaken public opinion polling research, as you would probably know, if you poll Canadians about their levels of support for energy development, whether it's oil and gas or renewables, majority of Canadians support oil and gas development, support renewable development, even support further development, so increased development uh, in, in those sectors, including, uh, including in oil and gas. What, what we do see, though, is that, that that, that Canadians are also looking for a balance between the economy, the environment, looking notably to the federal government around climate change and movement uh, on climate change. Where sometimes we see that level of support that is there sort of in the abstract, where we sometimes see that break down is when it comes to individual project proposals, where it's almost like citizens think with two sides of their brain on you know on the one side they think about what's in the interest of the country writ large in sort of an abstract way but then when there's an, a project in front of them that will have an impact on their community rather whether it's traversing through their community or or, or um, ending in their community then there's a little bit more focus on what the local interests and what their individual uh, what their individual interests are so I think what we need to think through is at that national level how do we put in place a framework that people can have confidence in, not only delivers for the economy and society and the environment writ large, but also is perceived as fair when it comes to the distribution of benefits and costs across the country? And I think linear infrastructure, back to Senator Doyle's question at the outset uh, of this session, linear infrastructure is particularly challenging in that respect, just given the way in which costs and benefits are distributed uh, on those projects. So what does fairness look like uh, in the 21st century? We're going to have to give that some pretty serious thought. I appreciate that, and, and, and I, I really think that one of the issues that we have is, is that Canadians are not looking at, at the benefits that are happening mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in downtown uh, Toronto because of the... Uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Export of uh, of crude oil from uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, that uh, they don't, don't see, they somehow have missed the the, the economics lesson that uh, that says that what's good for Alberta is good for Toronto. Now, how do we how do we link that? Because I mean, uh, uh, Senator Unger tried to uh, tried to do a link to the Aboriginal community. And I want to hear from we're going to hear from some Aboriginal people later on today. Uh, I I really think that we need to do a, whole, uh, a linkage here of, of by exporting bitumen from, from Alberta mm -hmm. uh, is good for every community in Canada mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, as we say in Atlantic Canada, high tide rises all boats. Yeah. And uh, this, is a, this is a very important high tide that we're talking about. It is, and I think in that context then it's all the more important to try to identify so what, what drives um, lack of confidence in these projects or what drives support or opposition to these, uh, to these projects. Research that we've done to date um, suggests, and again, I mentioned it in the presentation, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come back to that for this particular question here, um, that there are a variety of different drivers 
of support and opposition. Some of those can be economic. So where is the benefit for my community? And yes, there perhaps an economics lesson is uh, is in order. But some of the other concerns are, are much more about the way in which those resources are being um, developed and looking at the environmental impacts uh, of, uh, no, in this case, of oil and gas development, and specifically of oil uh, development. And to return to the public opinion polling data, that, that, that public opinion research that we've undertaken, you know, Canadians are confident that Canada can develop its energy resources in ways that respect the environment. What I think they've been missing up to this point is a plan. How are we going to do that? What is that going to look like? And so, um, uh, you know, again, uh, it, it's not, uh, you know, public opinion polling data that I'm aware of from other organizations suggests that, that you know, Canadians want to see a transition towards a cleaner energy future. They, they, they may think that transition can be undertaken more rapidly than is actually feasible uh, in economic terms, in environmental terms, in, in, in market terms, um, et cetera. But putting in place some sort of a framework that would um, demonstrate to Canadians that the country is moving in the direction of a cleaner energy future might actually take some of the pressure off of some of these individual projects. The final question, uh, Chair, is, um Buying all of that, who's responsible for, for, for building that confidence in, in, in Canadians? I wish I could say it was a single entity that was able to, to um, uh, undertake that relatively easily. As I said at the outset, the main message of my presentation today is that this you know, development of public confidence, it's a multifaceted challenge, and it requires a lot of collaboration and coordination across governments. I think there's a window of opportunity right now, and I'm cautiously optimistic uh, on this, there's a window of opportunity right now with a number of different decision processes that are ongoing. Um, we have the First Ministers meeting around climate. That's a wonderful opportunity to demonstrate movement in the country on that important issue. We have the Council of the Federation meeting around the development of a Canadian energy strategy. The federal government has been invited into that process, if all of that can, can be worked out, again, wonderful opportunity to look at what does Canada's energy future look like. Uh, and then third, we've got the Energy and Mines Minister's process, which this year is focusing in on public confidence as its key uh, theme. So an opportunity to look at, you know, at that level of regulation and issues that are within the mandate of Energy and Mines Ministers, what can be done to strengthen uh, public confidence. Um, so all of this to say multiple actors that need to be working together in a strategic and coordinated way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Mercer. Senator Runciman. Yes, thank you. I, I uh, you know, going through this process, I, uh, I, it's nice to hear you're cautiously optimistic because, uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, I, uh, I wonder if you could uh, talk about the implications of the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights with respect to how that may impact. I, I think there's a couple of elements here that I see in terms of, I'm just looking at a note here. Uh, this was uh, dated uh, not too long ago. It was this month, in any event. Uh, 100, 130 First Nations, led by Inca Dene Alliance, signed on to the Save the, Reser Save the Fraser Declaration of British Columbia in direct opposition to the Northern Gateway. And the pipelines are a no-go, said Stuart Phillip, Grand Chief of Union of British Columbia Indian Chiefs. Uh, you know, and. Uh, he was arrested, obviously, here at what's the Kinder Morgan Mountain Project. Um, and then we, we see the NEB uh, uh, approved Trans Mountain, twinning of an existing pipeline, and uh, automatically people are jumping to their feet, including the mayor of Vancouver, who shows up in Ottawa here uh, last week uh, to uh, lobby the government on, uh, on not approving Trans Mountain, even though the NEB has uh, approved it set up by over a hundred conditions, I believe. So I think that, you know, the UN declaration, the, the seemingly rigid resistance of, of so many in the uh, Aboriginal communities. Um, perhaps I can a ask you that first to get your reaction to that, and then I have another issue that I want to raise with you. 
the, the cautious optimism, I suppose, in, in part is, you know, is, is born of uh, uh, personality trait. Um, that said, there, you know, there's no question that this is going to be hard. There's no question that we're facing a variety <coughs> of challenges. Some of those policy gaps I mentioned on climate, on reconciliation, on cumulative uh, effects and, and regional planning, that is really hard slogging um, to address. The, um, it, it remains to be seen the way in which the government will implement the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, returning to a, a, one of the pref prefatory remarks in Senator Doyle's uh, comments, one of the concerns would be, um, would th that be implemented in such a way that it would confer a veto? Uh, if that is the case, um, that could be quite challenging uh, for any of these projects moving forward. So I think our federal government uh, definitely has its work cut out for it in thinking through the way in which it's going to implement um, that declaration. Uh, on some of the broader uh, on some of the broader issues, again, the you know there is an opportunity, and I certainly see this in terms of federal provincial relations. Um, you know, post-1980 in the National Energy Program, provinces actually coming together to collaborate around energy rather than to compete and, and, and conflict with one another uh, was a relatively challenging thing to do. We've seen significant movement on that through the Council of the Federation with the Canadian Energy Strategy. Uh, if the federal government is able to get engaged in that in a, in a productive way, again, there are, there are avenues that are there, but it's going to take some really significant and careful thought about what are the key issues that need to be addressed, who needs to be at, at the table, what are some of the areas where participatory democracy it may be coming into tension with representative democracy, uh, and where will, how will the government, governments, um, identify the appropriate balance points between those tensions that we're increasingly seeing? The other uh, element, I'm sure there are many others that uh, make me less than optimistic, uh, um, is this sort of the, the opposition, the third party opposition that is out there to seemingly any development in the energy sector. And uh, we've seen the, the, the mayor of Vancouver being very vocal, um, the mayor of Montreal and other mayors supporting his position uh, with respect to no pipeline through uh, that province, despite the fact they're importing from uh, countries that uh, have terrible environmental controls and uh, horrific uh, human rights uh, records, but uh, in any event, that's their position. And uh, if you look at the organizations like the World Wildlife Fund, uh, the Suzuki Foundation, they don't want anything coming under the ground. And they are well funded, uh, some of them with foreign money, U.S. money, uh, which is an ironic in itself because the U.S has sort of beaten us to the punch, if you will, in terms of development of the energy sector. They're now exporting oil. In any event, um, I, I, I made this point to representatives of the industry here that there has to be a, a more strategic approach on, on the economic side of this as well. You see the advertising, and I've watched the television ads on the broader economic impacts to the country, and we've heard that kind of testimony. We had a witness here uh, talking about a couple of more specific things, which I think should be an approach not just by the industry, but they have to bring in third parties as well, chambers of commerce, whatever it might be, the Canadian manufacturers. He talked about uh, Algoma Steel in Sault Ste. Marie, which is on its knees uh, and in terms of uh, production, and said that two LNG plants in British Columbia would represent half of a, a year's production out of that steel plant, could rescue them. They've been rescued a couple of times already by government. And he talked about over 100 businesses in Quebec that are dependent on the energy sector. And I asked, have you been into Sault Ste. Marie? They happen to have a, a cabinet minister representing that area in the province of Ontario, and the provincial government has not been terribly supportive. 
Have you been in there and talked to that community so they can make an impression on their own MPP? Have you been into those Quebec communities? Yeah. And to me, there has to be that kind of an effort as well, mm -hmm. because you can put these big messages on television. But, you know, we're going to be watching the hockey game or whatever, and that's not going to sink in. But if you right. can come into a community and say, we can assure you, you're going to have jobs for your, yourself, mm -hmm. your kids, your grandkids going forward, those are the kinds of messages that help to balance these other issues that mm -hmm. we've talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think there has to be a more strategic approach to yeah. getting the message out to Canadians mm -hmm. at, at a... At a more, uh, I don't know, familiar level, if you will, mm -hmm. with the household and the community itself rather than these big picture messages. So mm -hmm. in any event, uh, that to me should be a str strategy that they are looking at and, and they have to draw other people who are going to benefit from this. The provinces are mm -hmm. going to benefit from the communities are going to benefit from <coughs> uh, But I don't see that happening yet. Mm. Thank you very much for, for those remarks, um, which I would generally be very much in, in, in agreement um, with. Uh, certainly there is, um, uh, you know, there is a place for some of those broader communications messages around economic uh, impacts, but many of the things that, that we're seeing in our research as well really speak to exactly what you said, which is that importance of, of engagement at the community level and, and, and sort of hitting people uh, pardon that metaphor, but connecting with people where they, where they live and work uh, and connecting with them at the local level in terms of thinking through what are the impacts of, of energy uh, and, and other projects on their daily, uh, on their daily lives. Um, there's no question as well that, that the debate uh, has tended to be quite polarized. Um, but again, if you were to look at public opinion polling data, the majority of Canadians are not on either tail, if you will, of those polarized debate. The majority of Canadians really are uh, in the center and are looking for some sort of a plan. What, you know, where are we going with Canada's, uh, with Canada's energy future? Um, so I, I appreciate your, uh, um, you know, there's no question that it's a challenging issue. Um, that said, I think the elements, the elements are are there, um, but we need to be looking at this as a coordinated, multifaceted issue. There is not a silver bullet on this one. Senator, Senator Eggleton. <clears throat> well, thank you, Professor Gettinger, for uh, your presentation and drawing our attention to your metaphor of horses, uh, elephants, and the sitting ducks. Um, I think you're quite right in saying that um, people are looking for a plan, a balanced uh, plan or, or framework. Uh, for example, if, uh, if there is to be further accommodation of pipelines, uh, I think people want to know, well, what is the plan for climate change overall? How are we going to reduce our dependency on uh, fossil fuels? And uh, you, you've raised here a wide range of issues and a wide range of stakeholders that really need to be in, involved with all of that. Um, and the breaking down of silos, well, to me, it seems the federal government in consultation with the provinces and industry are going to have to be uh, doing a lot of that if it's, if it's going to get general public support and understanding of the, the direction that that this whole matter is going in, in terms of energy development. Let me uh, try to take some of the things that you've talked about here and relate it to uh, what is now going on in terms of the uh, National Energy Board uh, hearings. Um, uh, they, uh, they try to determine who is best to have before their, uh, uh, their hearings to try to represent the various interests involved. Uh, but Perhaps you're suggesting something here that would be broader. Uh, should all Canadians uh, have an opportunity to be exposed to that hearing? Now, you can't obviously have them all come to a table and sit here like we're sitting here or like the National Energy Board might conduct its meetings. But there are various social media methods, uh, new technologies that could be used perhaps in that regard. What would you envision in terms of uh, how the National Energy Board may play a role in this, because they're going to have a, a role in this in terms of the uh, licensing and the environmental assessment of the matter. 
That is the question of the day, I think, in 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 many um, respects. And as as we know, the new uh, at the federal level, the new government put in place a number of conditions and has now undertaken sort of a subsequent consultation process following uh, the NEB um, process. Um, it, it, it's a tough issue. And the reason that I say that is that, you know, if you go back to why was the NEB set up in the first place, and it came out of a Royal Commission, the Borden Commission in the, in the 1950s, it was very much about depoliticizing the process of energy decision making for individual <coughs> projects, right? I mean, this is why we set up arm's length, independent, quasi-judicial regulatory bodies, whether it's in energy or, or in other sectors, the governments set the overall policy framework, right? So what we're going to do around climate change, reconciliation, cumulative effects, et cetera, uh, and then confer on a regulatory body a mandate within which they operate to either approve, not approve, approve with conditions, individual projects that come before them. The approach that, that we're seeing right now concerns me a little bit, I must say, uh, in that I can understand the government's desire to expand the opportunity for Canadians to be engaged on these issues, to be engaged on individual projects, so to put in place these sort of post NEB consultation um, processes. But if, and we'll see, um, if what individuals who are engaging in those processes are engaging on are issues that are outside of the NEB's mandate, right? So climate reconciliation. It's not clear to me how that actually will help the government make a decision about an individual energy project. In the absence of a policy framework that addresses those issues within which a regulator then makes decisions about individual projects, um, it, 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 you know, we, we wind up with this sort of half policy, half regulatory process, um, which on climate, a, a, as, an, as an example, and I'll put this in a very extreme way, but I don't think it's a good idea for Canada to make climate change policy one pipeline at a time. So, <laughs> I take it what you're suggesting by all of this is that government, uh, federal, provincial, plus industry need to get out in front in terms of developing this balanced view of all this, so this, this, this framework, before you actually get down to uh, specific details of uh, specific projects at the National Energy Board. So, so in other words, you think it's uh, we, we've put the cart before the horse by rushing off to the NEB in a very limited fashion without having addressed all these other issues. I don't know that there's been much of a choice for yeah, governments yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in that sense, simply given where a number of these project proposal uh, processes are at. Um, that, that said, I mean, and again, the governments are in a bit of a tight spot on this one. They have timelines that they're facing with respect to individual projects, but some of these broad the elephants, the, these policy gaps around reconciliation, around climate, uh, are going to take a little bit more likely than six months uh, to, to sort through. So there is, there, there's some challenges there, that, that's to be sure, uh, but the, the, the way that you framed it up, uh, I, I would be in general agreement with. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, Senator Green. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your, your presentation. I missed uh, the, the first part, but it's, it's, it's excellent. I wish that I was here, actually. And I don't say that too, all the time. <laughs> um, uh, like you, uh, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic about this whole uh, project and, and what we're doing. And I think the reason I am <clears throat> is that I simply believe it would be an historic mistake not to bring p p petroleum to tidewater v via pipelines. You know, I, I really like your, um, your phrase, uh, building public confidence. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I really like that, and I certainly prefer it to, to social license. Um, if you, this is my only question, if you were put in charge of building public confidence, 
What are the one or two or three things uh, you would do that we're not uh, doing now? Wow, that's a that, thank you for that question. That's a wonderful question. Would that would that be true? Um, <clears throat> given the social and value change that that we have seen, you know, declining levels of trust, declining in governments, in industry, uh, declining trust in expert and, and expertise, it, it really does begin to point to thinking about how do we do energy differently. Uh, and that process becomes extremely important. Yes, substance and what the decisions are at the end of the day, but what is the process to get to those decisions and can people have confidence in that process? So on the broader questions that Senator Eggleton uh, was, was raising in, in his question, um, I don't know that I would call it a royal commission, but I would put in place some sort of third party, independent commission body that would be seen to be representative and credible, right? So that it would have representation from industry, uh, from ENGOs, from indigenous communities at the local level, engage municipalities rather than see them as a, a problem, which is often the case that we're, we're seeing right now. You know, put in place a process that would then have some confidence from members of the public that could begin to sort through and hash through some of these issues. That could very well include you know, robust consultation processes, um, commissioning studies that, that uh, would be relevant in terms of decision making for Canada's energy future. And I would call it something to that effect. Uh, you know, a, a, you know, a blue ribbon panel on Canada's energy future or something, something to that effect. Because I think, again, that would take a bit of time, but it would put in place a mechanism that could begin to develop some confidence of Canadians that, that governments are taking this issue seriously, that they are engaging in a way that is seen to be representative and that folks can have some confidence um, in, and that at the end of the day, recommendations could come out of that, uh, of that body, which then might be recommendations that would be very difficult for governments to get through, get to in intergovernmental processes, but might be easier for them to adopt had they been developed through a robust uh, process in which folks had confidence. That would be the number one from my perspective. Good. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. So that could be a recommendation in our report. Maybe. <laughs> well, Professor, our time is pretty well up. I want to thank you for your participation. And uh, sorry to interrupt here, but before a witness leaves, uh, she mentioned that she was uh, releasing a paper later this week, and I was wondering if, if we could perhaps get, get a copy of that paper uh, for the committee. Uh, Most certainly. It's within the next number of weeks. Okay, thank uh, you. Yes, but thank absolutely you. I can follow up with that. Good. Thank you very yeah, much. There's still in the second round. A quick, quick question then. Professor, given the... Uh, participatory democracy, which I translate as uh, activists who, as my colleague referenced, are funded by U.S. interests, and the fact that uh, right now the U.S. is exporting oil uh, to eastern Canada, uh, and of course their oil is coming from these uh, terrible countries with horrible human rights records. Um, and the fact that I'm reading more and more that Canada is lagging seriously behind in this race. Uh, I, I'm just wondering how, how this is fairness, can this balance ever truly be restored? Canadians are looking for balance, and you offered suggestions, but is this really a fight that that we've maybe lost, or I know you're optimistic, but uh, I wish I could be. Thank, thank you for the question, and I think it's very important to draw a distinction. At the outset of the presentation, I had you know a number of drivers of public confidence, and one of those one of those drivers was society, and including NGOs, including local communities, indigenous communities, friends, neighbors, uh, etc. I think it's so important to draw a distinction between what are the concerns being expressed by local 
communities, local residents and, and groups at the, the local level? Uh, and what are some of the concerns that are being addressed and, and raised by uh, whether it's regional, national or international um, non-government organizations, notably on, notably on the environment? And we're actually undertaking some work right now to try to tease out um, those distinctions, but I think they're very important to make because some of the more polarized elements of the debate are at the latter, uh, uh, with the latter groups rather than with the, the former groups. Thank you very much. Well, Professor, thank you again for your participation and uh, your attendance here today. We'll have to uh, suspend for a couple of minutes to see your next panel. Thank you. Thank you.